Welcome, everyone, to The Carb Watch. This is the show where we talk about weight management, healthy lifestyle. This is the practical stuff you can do to improve your health. I am your host, Ben Rogers, and I'm so honored to have Caitlin Tucker on the on the show with us Hi. today. Uh, Caitlin's from Knoxville, from Focused Integrative Centers. Uh, Caitlin, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what you do and who you are, and, and I cannot wait to get into some of the stuff we're going to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, like you said, my name is Caitlin Tucker. I work as a registered dietitian nutritionist in Knoxville. I do nutrition counseling, so one-on-one -on -one, uh, nutrition counseling, mainly for people struggling with disordered eating, but I see people for an array of um, issues regarding food, anything that has to do with food and helping you get a better relationship with food. I've, I've probably seen someone for all of it. So that's a little bit of what I do. I, you know, I'm so glad you, you came, you just came right out of the gates and said relationship with food and, you know, yes. based on a healthy relationship with food is really what the carb watch is all about. Why don't you talk to mm -hmm. us a little bit about, um, what it means to have a healthy and an unhealthy relationship with food? Sure. Yeah. So I think, healthy has such a, an interesting connotation around it. I think people have a lot of perceptions of what healthy means and they try to achieve healthy through different um, avenues and they have different definitions of what that is for each person, which is interesting. But really when I define a healthy relationship with food, you have a healthy physical and psychological relationship with food. Um, you are able to achieve balance in your meals, um, with a whole foods first approach, um, but you are able to not have it take up too much psychological space either, meaning it doesn't cause you a lot of stress or anxiety. Um, food makes you feel better, not worse, um, mentally and physically. And then when we look at an unhealthy um, relationship with food, we're going to see some markers um, psychologically and physically where there is some signs of unhealth, whether um, that is you're under eating or overeating, you um, are using some disordered eating behaviors, food causes you a lot of stress and anxiety, um, things like that. How do you think, because I, I, I know so many of our listeners can relate in terms of, and shoot, I can too, just having a little bit of stress about, about what you're eating. Am I eating the right stuff? You know, am I eating too yeah. much? Am I eating too little? Um, mm -hmm. How do you how do you talk to somebody about that? Like, how can we, how can we make it less of a stressful thing? Uh, is there anything, any like first things uh, that we can do? Yeah. Uh, I will, I 100% believe in a mindful and intuitive um, approach to eating. So I truly think, and I feel like research supports this, that our bodies are really, really smart. And when we listen to our bodies, when we tune in to what our body needs, it can tell us a lot about how we're fueling it. And I really think that when we listen to outside sources, that can, that can be helpful, but truly everyone's so individualized. So there are some education points when it comes to nutrition that a lot of people don't know. Um, just like basics, like food groups and macronutrients and calories and learning about those things is helpful. And I think that can be intimidating for people. Um, and that's where I want to, that's where I want to help. But also um, people can feel stuck when they feel like they don't have the resources or the education to nourish their bodies well. And that's where I like to use an intuitive approach because I think uh, a lot of people use meal plans or diets, um, specific diets to kind of guide them where um, that lasts for a little while. But if we uh, if we learn how to tune into our bodies, um, that can last us for a lifetime. So um, one of the things I talk about is uh, listening to your um, hunger and fullness cues. So listening to when your body feels hungry and is it actual physical hunger or is it maybe boredom or emotional um, hunger, I like to call it, in our fullness. Are we getting to a level of fullness that's satisfied, our bodies are satisfied, or are we going to a level that's uncomfortable every time we eat and our bodies are over full? And why are we doing that? And I think um, when we t tune into that, it tells us a lot about not only our nutrition, but also our psychological states as well. 
Is is that something that you can get better at? Is that something that you can practice in terms mm-hmm. of, because you keep saying intuitive and, and listening to those hunger, hunger uh, signals. And I'll give you an example. I was eating lunch with, with one of my friends uh, two days ago, and and he was he was hungry. He ate, and there was a there was about a ten minute period where he's like, "I need something else. Like I'm not full." And he told me he's like, yeah. "I know this will pass. You know, I'm actually not hungry. Uh, I'm actually not hungry anymore, but yeah. I'm tempted to go get more food right now." Is that is that kind of what you're talking about? Yes, that is 100 um, percent an example of what I'm talking about. I, I usually say for people get an amount of food that looks like it will fill you up, like how much you feel like your body needs at that point, eat it, and then wait about 10 to 15 minutes to see if if your body uh, needs more. Usually it takes about 10 to 15 minutes for those receptors in our digestive system to send our brains that, hey, we're actually full. That's why if we eat a lot really quickly, that's why a lot of dietitians say, slow down on your eating, because um, if we eat all of our food in 10 minutes and we go back for seconds, well, by the time your body sends to your brain, hey, we're good, you've already kind of overeaten. Is that why they say, um, because I I know my granddad used to do this religiously, he would just over chew his food. Is that that something that you counsel people on doing is in terms of slowing down how, how quickly you're eating? Yeah. In some cases I do say you might want to chew a little more, make sure you're actually tasting your food. I think that's part of the mindful process too. If we're going to enjoy the textures, enjoy the flavors, we can't just scarf it down. So one way I like to tell people is just a little habit is intentionally putting your fork down like every five, every 10 bites, uh, just as a way of mentally that you're, you're stopping and taking a drink of your um, water or whatever beverage you have. And then going back is like an intentional way of telling your body, we're not going to, we're not going to scarf this down. I love that. So that kind of goes in line with what you said about, you know, waiting 10 to 15 minutes after your meal Mm -hmm. before you go for seconds or decide that you need dessert. It seems that there are these patterns that, that you can build in, uh, to your life to, in order to, to not overeat. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think that, and it comes with time too. I think a lot of us, I think of, I always tell people think of when you are a baby, a baby cries when they're hungry. Um, and then they stop crying when they're, when they're satisfied. And then when they need to eat again, they do it again. And I think somewhere in our lives, we kind of lose lose our ability to be in touch with those signals we start listening to outside forces of this is how much you need to eat or you better clean your plate the happy clean plate club when we're younger or um finishing your plate at a restaurant or fast food it's it's more about when we listening to our hunger and fullness cues we can listen in okay i'm hungry my body's telling me i'm hungry so i'm gonna honor that and then, okay, I'm satisfied. My body's telling me I'm satisfied now. So we can lose touch with those, but if we're intentional, we can get those back with um, eating regularly and listening and taking our time with our meals. Caitlin, can can you tell us a little bit about where, is it ghrelin, ghrelin? There's a, a hormone, ghrelin. ghrelin. What? Because I know for for some people, grilling doesn't work as well, or they're not able to tell. Can you kind of tie that together? Because I think, because um, that's a perfect segue into some hormone stuff. Yeah, yeah. So leptin and ghrelin are hormones that um, basically satiety and leptin are tied together. And when I think of ghrelin, if you think of like grr, like growling, your your stomach is growling. That's how I kind of differentiate the two. Um, so I see, again, I deal with a disordered eating clients and eating disorders. And a lot of times when people are under eating, they can lose that ability to feel that hunger cue really easy. And they have early fullness. Um, so their stomachs aren't used to getting as much food slows down that, uh, ghrelin hormone is depleted and that leptin hormone is higher. And then opposite happens when, um, someone is intentionally or consistently, binge eating or overeating at their meals, that ghrelin hormone gets a little bit um, messed up along the way. Um, And we have more of that being produced because we feel like we need more food. And then 
um, it's pretty much the inverse of with under eating. So you don't feel full as quick. They feel like they can eat more than they actually need and vice versa. Is there a way you can manage those levels or is that, or is it just a matter of like getting better intuition? Like what can you do to, to improve on that, to get your, your ghrelin to work when it's supposed to and your leptin to work when it's supposed to? Sure. Sure. So like most hormones, hormones are pretty stubborn to change. Um, I usually see hormone changes three months at minimum. Um, if someone's getting a hormone panel done, it's really probably not going to be m- very helpful to get it less than three months apart. You won't really see much change. So it's going to take consistency and balance is what I like to say. Uh, and just a little bit of mindfulness with our portion sizes and amount of food we're eating. A lot of clients that I have that are under eating or struggle with restriction and they it's typically in the morning specifically, I think a lot of people, not just people with eating disorders struggle with not feeling hungry in the morning. Um, and it's really hard for them to eat breakfast, but that's a part of um, their recovery pro- process, my patients. Um, and so what I usually see, not every time, but it takes about a month or two for them to start getting those hunger signals back after consistently eating a balanced breakfast every day. So I think you can, I don't think there's any magic pill, but it's just eating good food for you um, in balanced amounts consistently. It's almost as if you have to act as if they work the way that, that they're supposed to, and then your body adapts almost. And that's, is that what kind of what you mean in terms of consistency? Yes. Yes, your body does adapt. Um, And really a lot of that has to do with leptin and ghrelin, but also your metabolism. So we know when we under eat and overeat, that affects our metabolism as well. Um, When we under eat, our bodies adjust, they lower that metabolism in order to meet the amount of energy it's been given. So part of that consistency too is I talk to my clients about building trust again with your body that you're going to feed it consistently and it'll trust you enough to help you raise that metabolism um, back to where it needs to be. Oh, I, I love that. I, I love that analogy there. And I, and I want to, I want to dive into the eating disorder thing a little bit because yeah. uh, you know, what we're trying to do is teach people how to, like you said, be mindful of what they're eating to, you mm-hmm. know, in many cases, watch their carbs, uh, you know, how do we do that with, with, in a healthy way? And so let's start by saying, uh, talking to us about what a eating disorder is. Can you, can you start there? Sure. Yes. Um, so an eating disorder by definition is just having a relationship with food that is disordered. And by disordered, that can mean a variety of different behaviors, um, going from restriction with food, under eating, uh, by massive amounts of calories, eating, you know, less than a thousand, less than 500 calories a day in some cases, um, to excessive exercising, which is another way of getting rid of calories, um, purging behaviors, which are using, um, actually throwing up or laxative abuse or things like that to get rid of food that's in your body and nutrients in your body. And then we have binge eating, which is kind of the other side of, um, eating disorders that you're overeating without any compensation to get rid of it, but you feel kind of out of control with those behaviors. Um, uh, we can we can develop eating disorders for a variety of different reasons, uh, but they all usually have something to do with the food. And there's another part that is not about the food that's usually um, potentially trauma, um, perfectionism, and type A personalities. Uh, there's a lot of different factors that can um, make you more susceptible to having an eating disorder, but they all kind of have those behaviors attached to it. It, it sounds like it kind of goes back to, to balance, you know, and mm-hmm. cause you know, one mm-hmm. thing that, you know, I would worry myself about is, you know, as I'm trying to get healthy, as I'm trying to watch what I eat, you know, can I go too far? You know, when does it become stressful? And, and sure. what I'm hearing from you is that when it becomes stressful, you know, then it be- it can become an unhealthy behavior, very similar to, mm-hmm. you know, over exercising. You know, it, it's almost yes. an an anxious, uh, an anxious behavior. Is that is that mm-hmm. kind of what you're saying? Can you kind of explain what's going on there? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So there is a safety. So I feel like with a lot of my clients, I see very black and white personalities. Black and white thinking is kind of what I call it. Very rigid, like 
I'm going to go all or nothing mm -hmm. in this. Yeah. And um, there's not a lot of balance there. And so a lot of times I talk about living in the gray. Like if you can get a workout in today, that's great. But if you can't, is it going to ruin your day? Like, is it going to affect your ability to show up in the world and be a productive citizen? Yeah. Um, same with eating. If you really want to prioritize eating whole foods and eating foods that are from the earth, great. But if, you, let's say, the only option you have for six hours is a fast food chain, can you make that work? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to, you know, potentially stress you out or cause you to not eat all day? So just kind of go it life throws us stuff sometimes and that's okay and learning how to move through that but a lot of times with people um that do have eating disorders or disordered eating there's a control factor there yeah. it feels good and it feels safe to only have these foods or only eat this many calories and it feels safe and good to have two hours of movement every day so how can we still do those in a healthy way that's not going to harm your body down the road yeah. It, again, it, it's, it's kind of a, a balancing act and, and cause I can see mm -hmm. how easy it could be to take this stuff too far or just completely ignore it. And, yeah. you know, and I know for the, for the listeners of the show, they're wanting to, they're wanting to, you know, get better uh, eating habits or trying to improve their lifestyle. Cause we're a big proponent that, you know, lifestyle is really how you get healthy, not just getting on a mm -hmm. medication, you know? So, yes. I, and I know you're dealing with this every single day. Is that, is, is that kind of what you're saying? Just find the balance. Don't be controlled by, you know, sticking to a regimen or anything like that, but also kind of having a regimen. Sure. Having, I, I, um, we use the phrase of like routines and goals, but not rules. Mm. If rules mm. means if you break it, you're bad, but, um, goals and routines mean, this is how I want to live 90% of my life, but there can be room for margin and that's okay because we're human. And if we feel like if we miss one day of a workout, we're just going to throw in the towel that doesn't leave a lot of room for margin, right? So having a little bit of space for that too, and just realizing with that black and white thinking, a lot of, and what, a lot of what I see is it leads to other unhealthy behaviors. Yes, sometimes the goal of having a healthier lifestyle is we wanna live long, we wanna live a healthy life. Well, if we go too far with that, a lot of times I see it can affect us long-term in unhealthy ways on the other extreme that that's not as many is not as much uh, talked about. Yeah. It's interesting because I, I think the original idea behind a healthy lifestyle and eating well is the idea that you're loving yourself by doing that, by, you know, yes. by doing those behaviors. And I think as long as we keep that mindset of, you know, we're still loving ourselves and it, it, it yeah. might, it might like help us from not going too far. Yes. And that's exactly what we talk about is the main thing here is treating your body respectfully. And if we are driving it into the ground, giving ourselves zero rest days, um, or just not doing anything, not taking care of our bodies, both of those aren't very respectful. Mm -hmm. And so how can we find that middle ground that's going to show our bodies the most respect? Because in return, our bodies do great things for us. But if our bodies are super tired because we're not giving them the rest that they need or the food that they need, it's going to show us. It's mm -hmm. going to, like I said, our bodies are really smart. It will tell us when we're not treating it nicely for lack of a better term. And, and one of the ways I'm sure our body explains this to us is through our endocrine system. So can you, yes. can you touch on that in terms of how all this relates to hormones and the way your endocrine sure. system works? Sure. I would love to. Um, and this is kind of something that I'm passionate about just because in my own life and, and getting into the nutrition field, I had to go through this a little bit myself with my own relationship with food. But our endocrine systems are fascinating. They are what produce and secrete hormones in our bodies. I mean, we have from our heartbeat to our metabolism, to our hunger and fullness cues, to our state of mind, our anxiety and depression, um, sleep patterns, sexual function, it affects all of it. 
And when our bodies aren't getting the energy, is not getting the energy it needs, or it's getting an excess in um, large amounts, it's hard to process. Both of those can cause disruptions in our endocrine system and in our hormones. Mostly what I see in my office, I see predominantly females. And females, when we have, uh, we have a reproductive system that is made to hold life, produce life. And um, a lot of times that's the first sign of an issue when someone is not treating their body respectfully with food. Most of the time under eating, but it can also happen with overeating is we have an irregular menstrual cycle, which is caused by, which is not normal. A lot of people think that's okay, but it's not. It's telling us, again, a sign our body, body is telling us that something's wrong and we have, we need to do something about it. So uh, can you say, so you're saying that an irregular menstrual cycle is, is something that it, like, that's a signal. Yes. It's oh. not a um, red alarm. That's like super bad, but it's just one of the signs that our bodies tells us that, Hey, something is off. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times our endocrine system is, mainly abrupted by stress, whether that's perceived stress, like anxiety about a situation or family stress that's outside of the body or physical actual stress on the body. Stress on the body can happen from lack of sleep. Um, again, our anxiety being too high, having a stressful work-life balance, not having a work-life balance, um, working too many hours a week, over exercising and then under or over fueling our body. All of those are physical things that create a healthy lifestyle. And if we're not pursuing those in the way that our body needs, it's going to send us some signals. And uh, the menstrual cycle is one for females. Um, a lower uh, sex drive and libido for men is actually one for men as well. So um, both of those systems can be affected for sure. Is there, is there a, you know, a particular, you know, type of eating disorder that, that you're seeing a lot of have this type of, uh, effect on the endocrine system, or is it both, you know, binge eating as well as, uh, you know, maybe just not eating enough? So I see predominantly with women that are under eating with anorexia, I see a lot of hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is just a fancy word to say that their um, period has stopped, their menstrual cycle has stopped because they are under fueling their body. Um, it, one example of that, it used to be called the female athlete triad, um, but now it's called red S, I believe. Um, basically, that's just a trifecta of um, over-exercising, under-eating, and lack of a menstrual cycle in, in females, and um, um, bone density is being disrupted as well. And all of that is because of our, our hormone system is affected. So I see that primarily with under-eating, and then in overeating and binge-eating cases, I see PCOS when there's um, higher levels of estrogen, lower levels of serotonin, and that can um, affect that population. It, does all of this in terms of like, okay, what do you do? How, like for the people who don't want to get there and for the people who want mm -hmm. to reverse what's happened, does it kind of go back to, you know, the, the start of our conversation in terms of just, you know, learning to listen to your body and, and, mm -hmm. and building that intuition muscle that we have in terms of, you know, what's loving ourselves and what's not? Yes, I think there is a lot you can do. My part is the food part for sure. Mm -hmm. If someone, I'll talk to the population who thinks they may be struggling with this. Um, again, my part, yes. The balance in eating, trying to have an intuitive and mindful approach to food and having grace with the process is going to be a great start. Sticking to whole foods most of the time, trying to get enough carb good carbohydrates, good fats, good proteins in, and also um, just just trying to have food often enough, listening to those hunger signals. But I would say too, if you do feel like you're struggling with this, seeing your doctor and a therapist as well, because a part of loving yourself is getting checkups, seeing if there's anything going on inside internally, but also dealing with any part of you, that control piece, that coping skill with um, food and exercise, to try to feel safe, that can be talked about with a therapist. Um, someone who's not 
at that point, they're just trying to get healthier and they don't want to end up struggling with any uh, eating disorder down the road. I would just say, do try really, really hard to practice mindfulness, practicing tuning into your body, um, whether that's through meditation or quieting down to try to listen to what your body needs, but also just doing those behaviors that we always talk about, but never really do like making sure we're getting seven to nine hours of sleep every night, making sure I, I tell people to try to eat every um, four ish hours. That's about how long it takes for our bodies to digest the meal that it already has. Um, if we go, if we have prolonged for mainly women, if we have prolonged periods of fasting, that can, that's been shown to disrupt our hormone cycle as well. Um, so just eating often, but eating the foods that, you know, is going to make you feel good. But if you choose foods that maybe you're wanting because they sound good or they're treats, that's okay too. Yeah. Let's just do everything in moderation. Um, and we're looking long-term here. We're looking for a healthy life, not just a healthy 30 days. So things that are practical. It really is. It's a long-term investment. It's a, it's a long game and loving yourself today is, is something that's going to pay off, you know, 10 years from now. And, and, uh, and Caitlin, I want to be, you know, super conscientious of your time. And as we're running out of, of our, of our show here today, um, how can people find you? And well, first of all, can you come back on the show? Because I find this stuff fascinating (laughs) and, and I want to make sure that, you know, as we're giving out, you know, all this health advice that there is a balance that comes with it, you know, loving yourself comes in many different forms. Um, so tell people how that, how they can find you and, and, and where you're at. Sure. Yes. If you feel like this is something that you want to talk more about one-on-one, um, we do have an Instagram page called Focus Integrative Centers. You can message us on that, or you can visit our website, focusintegrativecenters.com, schedule a session, or um, they can schedule a time for you can call uh, me. We can talk about what you need and see what avenue of nutrition counseling is right for you. Guys, it has, this has been Caitlin Tucker. Caitlin, thank you so much for your time today, and I can't wait to get you back on the show. Sure. Uh, to the listeners yes. out there, thank you for, for listening, for hanging out with us on the Carb Watch. Uh, and as always, we will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.